Well, uh, as you're being seated, just give the Lord a hand one more time, would you? What a great God we serve. Um, I would be remiss, first of all, if I didn't start out by saying our staff did an unbelievable job while I was gone. They were, everybody, all, the, all four guys were just great. I, I watched every service. It was tremendous. It's great to know that uh, you know, if I were to be hit by a bus today, we're in good shape, and we got a lot of guys that can step up to the place. So I want to thank these four guys, especially our staff. Thank you for letting me get away for some much-needed uh, R and R. I will be honest with you. I, I don't even know if I can be gone anymore. I can't be gone four weeks, and one president quits, and another one gets shot. So I don't know whether I would even try to leave or not, because it's amazing what's going on in our world. It's really incredible. So let me kind of set up what we're doing in the next two weeks, because some of you probably may be a little nervous. You say, golly, Pete, I thought we didn't do politics in the church. And we do, but we don't. So I just want to let you know right up front that uh, whatever your political persuasion may be, it's not going to be what you think is going to happen. What, what you may think I would say, I'm probably not going to come within a country mile of saying, but I will tell you what is really amazing. When I plan my messages out uh, a year in advance, I do that every year. So back in the spring, I'm thinking about what I'm going to be doing starting in August all the way through the next uh, June. And I could not get away from this two-part series. And I'll just say very gently, there were some people that pushed back and said, man, you don't need to come back from vacation. You don't need to be doing, talking about this. And then I'm gone, and, and, and seriously, a president quits, and one almost gets killed. And now we've got a woman running for president who didn't even think she'd be running for president. We've got another one that we didn't know would run again or not. And we've just had a Republican convention. We're about to have a Democratic convention. And I mean, everybody is talking about it. So in case those of you who are watching online or by TV, you haven't heard, there is an event that takes place in our nation every four years. And it generates more heat and more passion and more fire and more discussion from one end of the country to the other than the Final Four, the Super Bowl, the World Series, the World Cup, and the NBA championships put together. And so we know we, who the Republican nominee is going to be. We now know who the Democrat nominee is going to be. And so let me give you the bad news. Unless you decide to move to the Amazon rainforest in the next three months, or you decide to get into a soundproof bunker over the next several months, you're going to re be reminded again and again and again and again and again. There's an election going on. I'm watching the Olympics, and one minute they're shot in the put, the next minute they're attacking each other with ads. I mean, it's almost every minute, and you're just reminded there is an election going on. In fact, in 2024, it's now estimated $12 billion will be spent on political ads, just ads alone, just to make sure that you don't forget that there's an election going on. So the bad news is there's not only an elephant in the room, there's a donkey in the room and we can't get rid of them. <laughs> They're just here. So that's why I'm beginning today a little two-part series that we're calling Political Correctness. Now, before your blood pressure goes up, I don't mean what you think I might mean. Because here's what most people mean by the term political correctness. This is the concept of political correctness, which is based on the belief that speech or behavior that is offensive to various group sensibilities should be eliminated by means of regulations or penalties if necessary. In other words, if I say something that offends somebody, I shouldn't say that. If I say something that somebody disagrees with, I shouldn't say that. If I come across as too dogmatic or too fundamental or too convicted, I shouldn't say that. But honestly, that is not what I mean by political correctness. So let me tell you what I mean by political correctness. Being biblically correct in how we relate to politics, regardless of our own political preferences, philosophy, or perceptions. Now, that definition fits me. That's what I want to be. I want to be biblically correct in how I relate to politics. I don't care whether it's my preference, my philosophy, or my perception. You see, here are two things that if you're a follower of Jesus, you cannot do. You cannot be when it comes to politics, and you can't do it. Number one, we cannot be politically ignorant. You've got to be informed. I, I'm amazed, and I, look, I'm not running for office, so I can say this. So this won't come back to bite me on CNN one day. 
I'm amazed at how ignorant the average voter is in America. I'm just amazed. I, I really am. Because the first thing I look at, Matt, look at, to be honest, I don't look at party. I don't look at personality. I look at policy. I look at principle. What do they believe? What do they stand for? We can't be politically ignorant. We've got to be informed. We've got to be knowledgeable about the issues, about the candidates. What do they believe? Where do they stand? Who are they? On the other hand, and this is a greater danger to me, we cannot be politically indifferent. I hear people say, you've heard this all the time, well, the church should never be involved in politics. Well, that all depends. What do you mean by involved? If you mean one thing, totally agree. If you mean another thing, I don't agree. For example, if you're going to speak up on abortion, and I will, and if you're going to speak up about gay marriage, and I will, and if you're going to speak up about religious liberty, and I will, or if you're going to speak up about social justice, and I will, because the Bible clearly addresses all those issues, then you have to be politically involved. We owe it to, the, we owe it to our country and to our Lord and to our church to promote biblical Christian ideals and ideas in the political arena. So for those of you who kind of make the blanket statement, well, the church never be involved in politics, let me just make one clarification. When the political involves the moral and the ethical, it automatically becomes spiritual. When the political involves the moral and the ethical, it automatically becomes spiritual. However, here is the problem. There is a problem in the church, and it's a big one. And it is politics. I've lived a long time. I've never seen po politics become as incendiary and divisive and contentious as it is today. I've watched it with my own eyes divide families. I've watched it destroy friendships. And most importantly to me, and what breaks my heart, I've watched it dilute the gospel witness of the church. I want you to hear me clearly. I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not, this is nothing partisan about this. There's no political candidate, no political party, no political philosophy worth compromising and hurting the gospel of Jesus Christ. None. That's what we've got to keep above everything else. So there are two parts to politics, right? There's what I call the government. Now, what I mean by the government, that's our political institutions and our entities, the White House, the Congress, the mayor's office, whatever. There, there, there's there's, the, there's the, the government. But then there's the governors, the people in charge, the people in leadership positions. So as followers of Jesus, the good news is we do have biblical instructions on not only how we should relate to the government and to governors, but we also are told how the government and governors ought to relate to us. Now, having said all that, let me just kind of set everything up because I want to be an equally opportunity offender. <laughs> I realize that we have in this room and listening to me right now, what I would call died in the wool Democrats. I get it. And I realize that we have, it runs in my blood, Republicans. I get it. And I realize we have a growing number of people who say, well, I'm neither one, I'm independent. So I thought, you know, let me take a bipartisan approach to this whole issue. So I, I want you to hear me on two things. First of all, it has been well said. God doesn't ride the back of elephants or donkeys. Everybody hear me? God doesn't ride the backs of elephants or donkeys. So the first thing I always, my number one rule about politics is I don't make the political personal. I, I just don't. If you came to me today and you said, I want to tell you I'm a Democrat and I'm voting for Kamala Harris. God bless you. That's great. I'm going to go watch Georgia football and have a great day. <laughs> because I don't have to count for your vote. You have to count for mine. I don't know why we get all upset. No, that's why we live in a free country. It's great. I'm going to vote for you know, Donald Trump. I'm going to vote for RFK. I'm going to vote for whatever. It doesn't matter. So I, you know, having said that, I'm going to tip my cap right now to both sides. I'm going to tell two jokes. Now, if you like one, if you're a Republican, you will. And if you like the other, if you're a Democrat, you will. So you can kind of classify yourself. So here's my first one. There was a Republican and a Democrat. They're walking down the street, and they came to this homeless person. Well, the Republican gave the homeless person his business card and told him to stop by for a job. And then he took $20 out of his pocket and handed it to him. The Democrat was so impressed 
that when they came to another homeless person, he decided it was his turn to help. So he reached into the Republican's pocket and gave him $50. Now, some of you didn't laugh, so this one's for you. You're a Democrat. There was a woman in a hot air balloon, and she was lost. So she slouched down to a man below. She said, excuse me, I promised a friend I'd meet him, but I don't know where I am. And the man replied, well, you're at 31 degrees, 14.57 minutes north latitude, and 100 degrees, 49.09 minutes west longitude. She said, you must be a Democrat. He said, I am. How did you know? He said, she said, well, because everything you told me is technically correct, but the information is useless and I'm still lost. <laughs> Frankly, you're no help. The man then said, well, you must be a Republican. And he said, yes, I am. How did you know? She said, well, you've been, you're risen to where you are due to a lot of hot air. You made a promise you couldn't keep and you expect me to solve your problem. You're in exactly the same position you were in before we met, but somehow it's my fault. <laughs> so we can do this all day long, right? We're going to put all of that aside. Today and next week, put aside your party, your preference, your candidate, your philosophy, whatever you think is right. It doesn't matter. I don't even want you to think about who's the president, who may be elected president. But what I want you to do is I want you to turn to a book called 1 Timothy. It's right before 2 Timothy, if that helps you at all. It's in the New Testament. <laughs> Just turn toward Revelation. You'll find it. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because what you're going to find in two letters an apostle named Paul wrote every Christian, what he said we ought to do, we ought to do politically for every political leader. So here's the real central message of today. Ready? Every day, always pray for those political leaders who lead the way. Now, I did that on vacation. I took a whole bunch to figure this one out, all right? Every day, always pray for those political leaders who lead the way. So here's the question. What is the politically correct thing we ought to do when it comes to the governor, when it comes to the leader, when it comes to the president, when it comes to the senator? What is it we ought to do? Well, Paul says, I'll tell you three things as a follower of Jesus we always ought to do. Ready? Number one, we are generally expected to pray. Just as a general rule, we are generally expected to to pray. Now, what Paul is going to do to Timothy and in Timothy, he's really primarily addressing the church as a whole. He said, when you come together, this is how you ought to pray. This is how you ought to relate to your leaders, but it's also true individually. So here's what he says. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made, and he's real specific, for all people. Now, you see that phrase there, first of all. It's the only time that phrase is ever used in the entire New Testament. And it means not just first in time or the first thing you do. It means first in importance. He said, whatever else you do about a president or about a governor or about a senator or about a congressman or about a mayor, he said, first thing you do is you pray. That's why I want to say one more time. We, we should not make the political personal we should make the political prayerful. And there is a big difference. We're obligated to put first things first. So Paul said, hey, when it comes to politics, when it comes to policies, when it comes to positions, when it comes to partisanship, the first order of the church, the first business of the church is not criticism, it's not cynicism, it's not condemnation. He said the first order of the church is prayer. We ought to be praying, not complaining, not condemning, but pray. By the way, Jesus did not say, my house will be a house of politics. He said, my house will be a house of what? Prayer. So Paul not only tells us how to pray, then he does us a big favor. He says, listen, I'm not going to tell you that you should pray for the president or the governor or the senator or the congressman or the mayor. I'm going to tell you how to do it. And so he uses several words to describe the kind of prayers we ought to offer. First of all, he says, we ought to, we ought to pray with Petitions. Now, that's a very interesting word. It literally means to offer a request for a felt need. So let me just remind you of something. Whether you like a political leader or not, 
Whether you voted for one or not, whether you support one or not, whether you want one to be reelected or kicked out of office or not, let's put all that aside. Let me tell you one thing I know is true. Every political leader from the president to the senator to the congressman to the governor to the mayor, they all have needs. They all have problems. They all deal with stuff. And they need wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do it. So one of the things we need to do is to pray for the physical, spiritual, emotional, and political needs of our leaders. But then he says, not only should we give petitions, he says we ought to give prayers. Now that's a different word. And that's a word that means to bring someone or something before God for his blessing. So this may be hard. But Paul says we ought to pray that God would bless them with health. And God would bless them with strength. We ought to pray that God would bless their, their marriage if they're married. If they're married. We ought to pray that God would bless them with good advisors. We ought to pray that God would bless them in such a way that they'll turn their hearts toward him. And then he goes deeper. He said, there's another thing we ought to do, and it's called intercession. Now, this is a word that pictures meeting with a king and bringing a bold appeal for the king to act on. Here's what Paul was saying. You need to be urgent when you pray. This is not a la-di-da kind of prayer. When you're praying for the most powerful man in the world or the most powerful woman in the world or for the most powerful leader in your state, there ought to be a sense of urgency, not a half-hearted prayer, but a full-throated prayer. We ought to pray for our political leaders with the same passion, the same sincerity, the same fervor, whether we voted for that leader or not. You know, we hear a lot of talk about partisanship, and let me just give you a good bipartisan phrase. Partisanship stops at the door of prayer. I don't win every election. I don't know if you do or not. I haven't won a presidential vote sometimes. Doesn't matter. Every Thursday, done this for 40 years. Every Thursday, I pray for the president and his family. I pray for the vice president and her family. I pray for our senators and their family. I pray for my congressman and their family. I pray for the mayor of Duluth every single Thursday. Doesn't mean I like their policies. Doesn't mean I agree with them. That's not my role. That's not my responsibility in my prayer time. I ask God, Lord, please, would you put a blessing? Would you put your hand of favor on them and turn their heart toward you? And then finally, this is the kicker. In case you say, man, I don't want to do that. Then Paul, he kind of drives it home. He says, oh, by the way, do it with Thanksgiving. He's got a sense of humor. You say, but I'm not thankful. Well, then get thankful. Be thankful that we at least have leaders willing to serve in public life. Be thankful for how God can use that political person if for no other reason than to help us see more clearly what God's Word says about certain policies and decisions. And then remember, Paul says, these prayers that you're praying, they should be for all people. We ought to pray for all kinds of people, for all kind, with all kinds of prayers, friends, friends, enemies, citizens, immigrants, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. Because let me tell you something. I'm convinced of this. If the word of God is true, one minute of praying for a political leader will do more than one hour of complaining about them. So we are generally expected to pray. But then Paul goes deeper. We're not only generally expected to pray, we are specifically exhorted to pray. Now, Paul tells us how to pray, but then he says, let me tell you who to pray for. So here's what he says in verse 2. Now, watch this. For kings, or we might say for presidents in our case, for kings and all those in authority. So Paul says we're to pray for people in high places, people of position, and people of prominence, and people of power. Employees ought to pray for their boss. Students ought to pray for their teachers and principals. We ought to pray for our political Leaders, now let me just stop here. You may say, well, that's what's easy for Paul to write, and that was easy for Paul to say, and that was easy for Paul to do. Are you kidding? Can I give you a history lesson? When Paul wrote these words to this young preacher named Timothy, there was not one Christian leader in government anywhere on the planet. Now think about that. We do have some good godly people in office. We do have some good godly people in public service. 
There are some good godly people in Congress. I'm sure there are good godly people in the White House and in the Senate. And, 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 and I, we, we have good godly people who serve as mayors and governors. There are good godly people. When Paul wrote these words, you could go anywhere on the planet to any government you wanted to, want, wanted to, to any ruler you could find. God was not on their radar screen. And furthermore, not only was there no Christian ruler, believers had no political influence. They had no political power. As a matter of fact, if you were a believer, you were guaranteed you would not be put in a political p- position of power. Not one nation, not one had as had his motto, in God we trust. Not one. Practically every king, every ruler, they were all pagans. They were all unbelievers. And many of them were hostile to the faith. Many of them hated the church. Many of them hated Christianity. So I just want you to understand this. This is so important that you hear. Our leaders may not always call for our praise, but they always deserve our prayers. Now, I'm not saying, again, they're, they're not above criticism. They're not wrong to criticize. They're all, they're all speaking out when you think a policy is wrong or you think a, 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 you know, a, a particular position is wrong. But whether you like the person or the party or the personality or even the policies is irrelevant. By the way, the ruler of the Roman Empire, when Paul wrote this, was Nero. Nero loved Christians so much. You know what he did? He would put them on stakes and pour oil on them and set them on fire. That was the ruler of the Roman Empire when Paul said, hey, we need to pray for this man. We need to ask God to put his favor on this man. We need to ask God to turn the heart of this man toward him. So he said, wait a minute, pastor. What about leaders who are pro-choice? Or leaders who are anti-marriage or anti-Christian or anti-church? Can I be honest? that's probably even more of a reason we ought to pray for them. That's probably more of a reason why we ought to go to God for them. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whithersoever he will. I, I, I don't have any personal influence over Joe Biden or whoever's elected next, Trump or Harris. I don't have any personal influence. I don't need it. I can go directly to the God who puts them in office to begin with. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to really be praying. Paul said, I mean, it's it's really hard to believe. Look, let me just be honest with you. I've said this to you before, and this is just me. Again, this is why you don't need to get mad at me. I'm not going to be mad at you. I don't have to answer for your vote. I will not. I cannot vote for a person who's pro-abortion. I can't do it. I won't do it. I don't care whatever else they stand for. I will not do it. I cannot vote for a person who is in favor of gay marriage. I will not do it. I cannot do it. I shall not do it. I will not vote for a person who tries to muzzle the mouth of the church when we want to preach the gospel and just tell the truth whether they like it or not. I cannot do it. I will not do it. I cannot and I will not vote for someone who believes there's more than two genders and believes it's okay for a boy to go to a girl's bathroom and a girl to go to a men's bathroom. I cannot do it and I will not do it. Now, if that makes you mad, you apologize, I'll forgive you. Well, I'm going to do it. I'm a Democrat. I'm this, I'm that. Great. I want to remind you of two things. I don't have to answer for your vote, but you will. So you better be ready because I got news for you. When you stand before God, well, why did you vote for this person? Well, I was a Democrat. That ain't going to wash. Or I was a Republican. That's not going to wash. So no, I can't vote for these people. That's one thing. But I'm even a bigger sinner than they are if I don't pray for these people. And I don't take them before the Lord. And and I want to tell you the kind of heart we ought to have. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how powerful any particular ruler or leader is. Let me remind you of one thing. They're not God. They are not sovereign. They are not all powerful. Listen to me. Not every ruler is anointed by God, but every ruler is appointed by God. I want you to hear me clearly. Let me just give you some reminders. This is why when I go to vote for whoever I vote for, I'm always reminded at the end of the day, it's not my vote that counts. It's God's sovereignty that counts. That's what counts. So let me just give you some reminders, just a few. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. Watch this. He brings one down. He exalts another. Here's another one. He changes times and seasons. 
He deposes kings. He raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Here's another one. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. I'm from the country. There's an old country saying some of you have heard. If you ever see a turtle on a fence post, he didn't get there by himself. So let me just be honest. One man gets elected and you got this crowd that says, yep, God put him in office. I got news for you. Everybody in office, God put in office. You don't get in office unless God calls it or God allows it. Now you may say, well, why would God put so-and-so? Well, Thomas Jefferson said, people generally get the kind of government they deserve. So sometimes we get the people we don't want, but maybe it's the people we deserve. Maybe it's the kind of people where it's God's wake-up call. This is what you get when you don't follow me. This is what you get when you don't trust me. This is what you get when you put certain people in office. This is what you get. I just know one thing. At the end of the day, whoever is elected, like we do every week, we'll pray for them when they get elected. Whoever gets elected in November, you know what I know the next day? That was the sovereign will of God because if it wasn't the sovereign will of God, it wouldn't have happened. God is sovereign. There's not a bird that falls to the ground that God doesn't know about it. There's nothing that happens on this earth that God doesn't cause it or God doesn't allow it. So it's God who sits one down. It's God who puts up another, whether it's a president, a king, a queen, or a dictator. So that means whether a president's right or wrong, we ought to pray for him. Whether we agree with him or not, we ought to pray for him. Whether we like him or not, we ought to pray for him. Whether he's a liberal or conservative, we ought to pray for him. You say, wait, what, well, what difference does it make? Well, I firmly believe this. The church can influence the nation more through supplication than the Congress can by legislation. If what we believe about the Bible is true and what we believe about God is true, then I know that my prayer is a lot more powerful than some law. You know another reason I know that? Laws come and go. You want a great example? Roe v. Wade. Everybody thought it was going to be the law of the land. No more. Laws come and go. Lawmakers come and go. One of these days, Chuck Schumer will be dead. Mitch McConnell will be dead. Nancy Pelosi will be dead. I will be dead. Lawmakers come. Lawmakers go. Let me tell you two things that never goes anywhere. This word never goes anywhere, and God never goes anywhere. Ever. So... We don't have to answer for any political leader. I don't have to ask for the decisions they make, the actions they take, the policies they propose. However, we do have both the political right and the biblical responsibility to speak up for what is right, speak out against what is wrong. And when all is said and done, we don't have to answer to them or for them. But I'll tell you what we will answer for. Did you pray for them? Did you intercede for them? Did you trust me enough? Forget them. Did you trust me enough to believe I could do something with them? I can change their heart. Because I got news for you. I can't change Joe Biden's heart. I can't change Donald Trump's heart. I can't change Nancy Pelosi's heart. I can't change Campbell's heart, Harris's heart. And here's the good news for me. That's not my job, but God can. So we are generally expected to pray. We are specifically exhorted to pray. But then Paul says one last thing, and this is a positive note. We are hopefully encouraged to pray. Now, what's the purpose of prayer? All right, let me tell you what it's not. You ready? This is not the purpose of prayer. It is not to get our political leaders to do everything we want them to do. Now, it's good to do that. That's not the real purpose. And by the way, the purpose of prayer, this is why a lot of people pray. They, they want to make, we just want to live without any difficulties. We want to live comfortably without any persecution. We don't need Christians from the outside world. Paul says, that's not the reason why you ought to pray. Here's why you ought to pray. Now watch this. You, ready? you would have never dreamed this is why we ought to pray. Here's why we ought to pray. So that we, the church, may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. You see, when we pray for political leaders, we're really praying for ourselves. We're really praying that we'll be what God wants us to be. Because at the end of the day, I can't make Joe Biden be what he ought to be. I can't make Donald Trump be what he ought to be. I can't make Kamala Harris be what he ought to be. 
she ought to be. I, I can't make senators make what they, be what they ought to be. You know what I can do? I can make sure I'm what God wants me to be. And so when I pray for them, I'm actually praying for me. Because here's what Paul says. He says there are two things that will result and should result and can result when we pray for our political leaders. No, it's not that they may change their policies. It not, may, may not be that they may go from being pro-choice to pro-life or pro-gay marriage to pro-traditional marriage. That may not happen. But he said, I'll tell you two things that could happen. Now watch this. This is great. One is peace in the nation. Peace. I believe without a doubt. I'm convinced of this. I think one day we get to heaven, I'll be proven right. We've had over two centuries, unheard of in history, of political liberty. And for the most part, financial prosperity. And for the most part, domestic tranquility. And I believe this with all of my heart. We get to heaven. You know why that was true? It wasn't because of the Constitution. It wasn't because of our military strength. It wasn't because of our nuclear bombs. You know why we've enjoyed two centuries? Because of the prayers of God's people. God heard our prayer. God's blessed our nation. By the way, that word peaceful refers to outward tranquility. And I'm going to say it. I don't believe it's a coincidence that we've never had a foreign bomb dropped on our soil by an enemy plane for over 200 years. No foreign country's ever set foot on our soil. It may happen someday, but don't underestimate the power of prayer in the stability that we've enjoyed. And by the way, the word quiet refers to inward tranquility. I thought, well, what, what did Paul mean by that? And then it hit me. There is something about prayer that puts a nation at rest. If you remember, some of you are old enough, if you remember 9-11, we probably prayed more as a nation the day after 9-11 than we've prayed in since World War II. And if you remember, there was this unity. There was this peace. There was this put all our political differences aside. There is a God we trust in. And we need to be reminded there's that God we trust in. There's something about prayer that puts a nation's heart at rest. And do you realize, if we prayed more for our leaders instead of arguing more about politics, we'd fight less and get more accomplished. Why, instead of wasting all the time to start debating your neighbor over debate, you're not going to win and you're not going to convince him of, why don't you take that same energy and pray because I believe that prayer is more of a protective shield than we even realize. But Paul said, when you pray, the result can be peace in the nation. But this is even more important. He said, it can also result in purity in the church. He said, it will encourage us to live godly, holy lives. And if you don't believe that, let me ask you a question. Is there anything you can do more godly for our political leaders than pray? You ought to vote. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. That's not more godly than praying. You ought to criticize and where they deserve it. That's not fine, but that's more godly than praying. There's nothing you can think of that is being more godly than to pray. Can you think of anything more holy that when we pray to a sovereign God that our leaders would be holy so that we would be holy? We've got to realize how important prayer is both as a church and as individuals because when you pray, it's not that just maybe something happens to your circumstances, but when you pray, something happens to you. It happens to your character. You sense the presence of God. You feel closer to the person of God. You understand the need for God in your own life. And I got news for you. When you pray for political leaders, it's pretty hard to hate them. When you pray for other people, it's hard to stay mad and get mad and be mad at people that you pray for. But I want to, I, I want to get to say something else. The reason why we want to pray to be godly and holy is because part of being godly and part of being holy is voting and lending a voice to the political process. So while I'm in the neighborhood, I do want to say this. Shame on you if you don't vote. Shame on you. If you do not exercise your right to vote, you're no, better, you're no better off than people who are under a dictatorship who can't vote. And I believe, do believe one thing. I've had a brilliant mind say this to me over and over, and I agree with it. If you don't vote, don't criticize. If you don't vote, be quiet. You don't have a dog in the hunt. You don't have any cards in the game. Christian citizenship demands that you vote. But the fact still remains we'll have more influence in the prayer closet in the long run than we'll ever have at the ballot box. 
So yeah, we ought to pray for our political leaders at the same time that we live such godly lives that the world will sit up and take notice and see just how powerful the church really is. Now you may sit there and say, well, a lot of these liberals, they're not going to vote for us. A lot of these conservatives are not going to vote for us. That's what makes the church different. That's what makes the church special. That's what makes the church unique. And that's why, hear me clearly, the church should never be identified with any political party or any political candidate. Because at the end of the day, we're not even citizens of this world, folks. We're citizens of another world. We're just, listen to me, we're all immigrants in this world. This world is not my home. I wasn't made for this world. You weren't made for this world. My citizenship is in heaven. I have a president, but he's not my king. I have a president, but he's not my Lord. I have a president, but he's not my master. I have a president, but he doesn't control my life. He controls my life. And I was put here to glorify him and to edify him, and to magnify him. We are kingdom people, and our ultimate authority is not a president, it's not a king. It is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's why you're going to see next week, it is not only the duty of the government to protect the citizens, it is the duty of the, of the church to pray for the government. Now, if you're still one of those people that say, you can just keep preaching all you want to, I'm not praying for blank. Well, let me tell you one last reason why you should. And why you should want to. In fact, why you should be eager to and why you should be glad to. You ready? Paul says this. This is good and pleases God our Savior. This is good and pleases God our Savior. I don't need to give you any other reason why you ought to pray. For every political leader, pray for our governors and pray for our government. He said, this is good and it pleases God our Savior. So you should have in your hand, we had one in the seat. You should have this card. Everybody got this card? I'd like for you to take that card, put it on your desk, put it in your Bible, put it on your bedstand or whatever. And I'd like to ask you on a daily basis as we face this monumental election that you, you just pray for God, pray for God to turn the hearts of our leaders toward righteousness and holiness. Pray that our political leaders would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Pray that our leaders would live exemplary lives and set good examples for the people of our country. Pray that our leaders would faithfully promote what is just and right and fair in the sight of, the, of God and good people. So, we wrap up. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And some of us will be excited and some of us will be incited. Some of us will be glad, some of us will be sad, and some of us will be mad. I get it. Some of us will be elated, some of us will be disappointed. But as we pray for our leaders, no matter who is elected, we must pray for ourselves. So let me tell you a good way to do it and we'll be done. There was a pastor named Fred Holloman. He was a Southern Baptist pastor. He served for more than three decades as chaplain for the Kansas State Senate. Well, the thing about Holloman that was so great was he was kind of a country guy, but he was funny. He just had great sense of humor. And um, some of his prayers were funny, filled with truth, but funny. Whenever they knew that Fred Holloman was going to pray, the place would be packed. I mean, not just the Senate. Everybody from the other chamber would come. They wanted to hear this man pray because they never knew what he was going to say. So they so loved his prayers, he wrote a book about those prayers called The Book of Uncommon Prayers. So on one occasion, he began the state senate session by praying this. I love this. Listen to what he said. Omniscient Father, help us to know who's telling the truth. One side tells us one thing, the other just the opposite. If neither side's telling the truth, we'd like to know that too. And if each side is telling half the truth, give us the wisdom to put the right halves together. The one who died on the cross and came back from the grave said, I am the truth. So no matter who's elected, in whatever office, with whatever power, whatever influence, 
Here's what we're going to do as a church. Here's what we must do as followers of Jesus. We're going to look to the only king, the only Lord, the only Savior, and the only ruler that really matters, and his name is Jesus. Let's pray together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, first of all, thank you for my sweet church. Thank you for the joy of being back. Thank you for your word. And Lord, I'll be very transparent with my people. No, it's not always easy to pray for certain leaders. It's not always easy to get out of the flesh, put aside anger, disappointment, bewilderment, to come before you and to really say what I don't want to say and pray what I don't want to pray. But I also know the freedom it's given me to know this is good and it pleases my Savior. So with his bowed and eyes closed, I hope this comes across right. I mean it to come across right. I pray our church in the next several months would be more passionate for the gospel than we are about politics. I pray that our church would be a lot more concerned about people surrendering to Jesus Christ than who wins the White House or the Congress. And I pray most of all that when the smoke clears and the morning comes, and we know who our next president is, that we'll remember the things that have not changed. The Bible's the Word of God. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. God is in control of all things. Our job is to be holy and pure and clean. And we get up every morning with the joy of knowing at the end of the day, God works everything out together for the good of those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. So the question I want to ask you this morning is this, not who are you going to vote for in the ballot box? Who have you voted for with your heart? Because at the end of the day, you will have voted. When you end your life, you'll have voted for one of two things, God or somebody else, God or something else, Jesus or somebody else. It'll be Jesus or some other Savior, Jesus or some other God. You have to vote. You have to make up your mind. Was this Jesus who he said he was? Did he do what he said he did? He said he died on the cross. He said he came back from the grave. He said he paid for your sins. He said he wants to come into your heart. He wants to live his life through you. He wants to take full control of your life, and he wants you to live for him. Have you taken that vote? Have you signed your name to that ballot? If you're watching right now online or watching my TV or you're in this room and you never have, I'd like to ask you to cast the greatest vote you'll ever cast. It has eternal consequences. And here's the way you do it. You just simply say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I don't need a president. I don't need a senator. I don't need a king. I don't need a governor. I don't need a mayor. I need a savior. And I believe you're that savior. And I'm asking you right now, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender all that I am to all that you are. I want to thank you for hearing my prayer. I want to thank you for saving me today. And now, Lord Jesus, help me to live for your glory and for your honor. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you're watching online right now, would you let us know about it? Would you just go to crosspointchurch.com slash next? Let's let us hear about your decision. We want to help you begin your walk with the Lord. But if you're in this room and you made that decision for Christ today, you're a teenager, a child, an adult. You gave your life to Christ. You cast the most important vote of your life. Would you let us know that? Here's how you do it. When you walk out of our building today, there's a table there called Next Steps. It's right in the middle of our lobby. Would you go to that table? I'll be at a table. If you want to come to me and let me know, come to me. 
Would you just come and let us say, just say, hey, I cast that vote for Jesus today. I, I, I gave my life to Christ today. Let us help you begin that walk with God. You know, all these people we baptized, so many people in the month of July were so thrilled. You know, every time somebody gets baptized, you know what they're doing? They're letting you know they've cast their vote for Jesus. Some of you say you voted for Jesus. Have you let it be known publicly by baptism? No, you haven't. Some of you need to go to that table and say, you know what? I need to be baptized. I didn't know that's what that was all about. I want to let people know that I voted for Christ. I voted for Jesus. Maybe you need to join this church or maybe you need to find a place to serve. But Father, this is my prayer. I want us to be politically correct in the right way. And that means to be be biblically correct your way. So use the message for your glory. Thank you again for the gospel. And thank you again for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, would you stand to your feet right now? We've got one last song we want to sing. Thank you guys for coming in. By the way, if you're a guest of ours, I'll be at a table out back. I'd love to meet you when the service is over. And we'll close our service today with praise.